Hello and welcome everyone to Pine Forest Ecology with Millstone 4-H Camp. We're thrilled to have you join us today. It takes a few minutes for all the attendees to enter the webinar room. So as you are coming in, tell us in the chat where you are joining from, the city and state. And if you are an at-home learner or if you are joining us from a classroom. Before we get started, we'd like to review a few rules related to the virtual environment. Today, we are using a Zoom webinar room. In the webinar room, you do not have the option to turn on your video camera. You should only see the presenting hosts and panelists for today's program. The chat function has been set to panelists only, meaning you will only be able to view and chat with our presenters and hosts. This is for the safety and protection of all of us in the virtual learning environment. At certain points during the virtual learning session today, our presenters may ask you to type in the chat to answer questions or provide feedback. We will let you know when those designated times are. If you have questions, you are welcome to enter them in the chat window at any time. We will do our best to answer questions, but may not be able to answer all of them. Please note that today's session is being recorded. Please be respectful of each other, our presenters, and hosts in the virtual environment. Bullying, inappropriate language, or behavior are all grounds for dismissal from the program. Now, I'll turn it over to our second host, Angela Brisson, to share more about today's program. Good morning, everyone. We're excited to have you and happy October. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, if you haven't already told us, go ahead and tell us in the chat if you're an at-home learner or joining us from a classroom and let us know if you're uh, rejoining us, if you've been with us for uh, Beaver Pond Explorations or started out with Coastal Ecology with the Eastern Center. Um, we're happy to see you all again. Uh, today's program is Pine Forest Ecology, hosted by our very own Millstone 4-H Camp. Millstone is nestled in one of the most beautifully restored longleaf pine forests in the southeastern United States. Uh, and the longleaf pine forest ecosystem is a really unique ecosystem uh, to North Carolina and to the southeast. So today we're going to take a virtual hike through the forest at Millstone to explore the plants and animals uh, that haven't, or excuse me, that call it home. Um, if you haven't already, be sure to download the learning and discussion guide. I'm going to put the link for this in the chat window so you can grab that. That is a worksheet uh, that you can use to follow along as we go. Uh, this program is provided by the North Carolina 4-H Camping Program as part of NC State University and the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service. Uh, our 4-H Camping Program, if you're joining us again, you know this now, uh, includes three centers at locations uh, across the state. We run spring and fall school programming and then a traditional summer camping program from June through August uh, at these centers. Um, and today, we are going to do something a little bit different if you are joining us again or if this is your first time. Uh, so um, I see somebody's already asking about downloading the app in, in the chat. Um, so we're going to play Kahoot, which is a really fun um, online game app for kids so we can learn about longleaf pines. Um, if you haven't already, go to your app store on your secondary device, so on a phone or a tablet, um, and you can download the Kahoot app. Uh, alternatively, if you do not have a secondary device or you can't download the app onto your phone or tablet, you can go to uh, the Kahoot um, URL that I just put into the chat window. Uh, if you do that, you're going to have to run the Zoom um, screen and the Kahoot screen on your uh, laptop or your desktop, whatever device you're joining us from, um, at the same time. So you'll want to minimize the Kahoot screen, and then you'll want to minimize the Zoom screen so that you can have one on half of your screen and the other on the other half. You'll need to be able to see uh, the Zoom, that's where the questions are going to be posted, um, and then you'll use uh, the Kahoot screen to answer the questions. Um, so we're going to give everybody plenty of time uh, to get into the Kahoot, and I actually need to bring it up, so give me just a second here. There we 
go. Make this full screen and pull up the chat so I can see what you all are saying. Excellent. Okay, so I'm gonna hit the play button here. So you can go again, you can go to www.kahootit for the Zoom and the Kahoot on your screen, or you can download the Kahoot app. When you get there, you're gonna enter this game pin, this 3076391. All right, we've got some folks joining us. Yep, and we'll give everybody plenty of time to get on here. So again, you can go to www.kahoot.it and enter this game pin, 3076391. Or you can download the app on your mobile device or your tablet quickly um, and enter the game pin there. We recommend that's the best way to do it um, so that you can see the screen uh, through the Zoom, through the Zoom share screen and answer on your secondary device. Uh, but if you don't have a device or you can't get the app to open or download, then you can go to www.kahootit and join that way. Um, so it looks like we've got about, 50 or so participants and only about half of you are on so far. So we'll give everybody another couple of minutes here to get into the Kahoot. And if you're having really a ton of trouble and you can't get into the Kahoot at all, that's okay too. Um, you'll be able to see the questions on the screen and you can put your answers into the chat window. Um, so don't worry if, uh, don't panic if you're having uh, technical difficulties with this. As long as you can see um, our Zoom screen and put your answers in the chat, you can still participate. So we'll give another minute here. I love all these uh, these nicknames, Bold Bison, Winged Owl, very cool, Gentle Cat, <laughs> these are funny. All right, we still got folks joining us. So again, if you're just coming on to the Zoom, we're playing a, a Kahoot game to learn about the Longleaf Pine Forest at Millstone. Uh, your game pin is 3076391. So you can go to www.kahoot.it to join that way or download the Kahoot app to your secondary device and join there. We've got 53 participants and it looks like we've got 40 folks into the Kahoot. So I'm gonna give everybody just a, another couple minutes here um, to get in. And if you're having really um, awful technical difficulties, uh, then don't worry about it. As long as you can see the screen, you'll be able to see the questions and you can put your answers into the chat window. And you can keep trying to join as well once we start, uh, once we start the play the pen will be on the screen so you can still uh, join then. Welcome Social Snail and Joyful Zebra, glad to see ya. All right, so it looks like we're missing a few folks here, but that's okay. We're gonna go ahead and get started. You can continue to try to join the app, or if you would um, like to and just wanna stop messing with the technology, then you can just enter your answers into the chat window. And I'll ask my colleagues to keep an eye uh, on the chat as I'm running the Kahoot here. All right, y'all, so we're gonna go ahead and start and play. Our first question is a multiple choice quiz question. 
So 1,600 uh, plant species are found in the southeastern United States. Of these, how many are found only in longleaf pine forests? This is your best guess. How many are found only in longleaf pine forest? You've got less than 10% in red, more than half in blue, none of them in green, all of them in gold. Awesome, there we go, more than half. That's really astounding. Longleaf pine forest ecosystem is only in the southeastern United States, and you've got um, 1,600 plus plant species that are found there, and half of them are only found in that ecosystem. They're not found anywhere else in the world. That's pretty cool. All right, we've got our leaderboard here. Winged owl is at the top. Good job. We'll go to our second question. True or false, when first growing, the longleaf pine grows in a grass stage where it looks like a bundle of needle-like grass. So blue is true and red is false. If you're still looking for the game pin, you can see that down here in the bottom right corner. It's 307-6391. Good job. Everybody mostly got this right. That's true. It does just look like a bundle of grass uh, that's growing on the ground when it first, uh, when it first starts growing. Oh, we've had some change there. Proud Condor and Rocky Gazelle moved on up. Good job, guys. We'll move on to our next question. Okay, so this is a multiple choice again. Longleaf pine seeds need what type of natural event to trigger their growing process? A flood, a tornado, a lightning storm, or a forest fire? There you go, and 33 of you got that right. Great job, a forest fire is the natural event that's needed to trigger uh, longleaf pine seeds to, to grow. And we'll learn a little bit more about that uh, in our presentation in a few minutes. Rocky Gazelle's on fire. Nice job, everyone. Proud Condor to, uh, moved up to the top spot. True or false? Longleaf pine used to dominate the southeastern coastal plain region, covering 90 million acres of land. So is this true or false? True in blue, false in red. Good job, that is true. And the, the map was on, that was on the screen, um, the picture showed what that um, native habitat was um, for the longleaf pine ecosystem in the southeastern US. Knowing sea lion is up on the board. Good job, everyone. This is a quiz question. Unlike other pine species, the longleaf pine grows slowly and can live up to how many years? 50 years in red, 100 years in blue, 300 years in green, or 150 years in yellow? All right, that was a little bit harder of a question. Um, the 18 of you that selected 300 years were correct, and that is really very unique and very rare for pine species. Most pine species um, grow very quickly and um, die within 100 to 150 years. So it's really unique that the longleaf pine uh, lives for around 300 years. That's pretty cool. Good job. All right, we've got some new folks up on the leaderboard here. Lovely Ant, Purple Goose, Proud Condor still holding that top spot. All right, this is a multi-select quiz question, so you can choose more than one answer. Uh, Longleaf Pine now covers only about 3% of its original habitat. Which of the following activities have contributed to this? So clearing space for agriculture in red, making syrup from their sap in blue, reducing forest fires in yellow, and building ships and railroads in green. 
All right. So the, the red, yellow, and green were all answers that you could um, select that were correct. So uh, clearing space for agriculture, for farms to, to grow food, um, reducing forest fires, uh, and then building ships and railroads. So uh, harvesting the lumber from the trees to, to build things. Um, we don't make syrup from the sap of pine trees. It's not very um, sweet. Uh, so that would not be, uh, it's not a good, good tree to make syrup from. Um, but we do make syrup from maple trees, from sugar maples, which uh, grow, um, they grow here in North Carolina, but they're, they really grow, they like to grow in the uh, northern part of the United States where it's a little bit cooler. Um, so we don't want to eat syrup from pine trees. Good job, Purple Goose moving all the way up to the second spot. Got a couple more questions here. This is a multi-select one as well, so you can select more than one answer. Uh, Longleaf pines prefer what kind of soil to grow and thrive in? Dry soil in red, wet soil in blue, sandy soil in green, clay soil in yellow. All right, excellent. If you chose dry and or sandy soil, you are correct. Um, clay soil tends to, doesn't drain water very well and um, these trees don't like to be, uh, don't like to have their roots in, in water, in wet soil. So they like that dry sandy soil, uh, which is really part of the reason why um, they're so prevalent in the southeastern United States. We tend to have dry sandy soils in that part of the country. All right, last question. And if you were paying attention at the beginning, you should know the answer to this. True or false? Millstone 4-H camp is nestled in one of the most beautifully restored longleaf pine forests in the Southeast. Is that true or false? Awesome, almost everyone got that right and that is true. You can see in that picture that was the campfire circle at Millstone and all the beautiful big uh, pine trees there uh, at camp. Uh, and so that was our last question and we'll see who ended up in third, second and first place. Congratulations Purple Goose. Knowing sea lions in second. And then Proud Condor in first place. Good job, everyone. I hope you had fun with that. Uh, we're gonna actually go explore Millstone now. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, my colleagues at Millstone, Aaron Fry and Keith Russell, who are the program director and the center director at Millstone. And we're gonna go on a virtual hike and explore some of uh, the plants and animals that we can find in the longleaf pine forest. Great job, everyone on the Kahoot. All right, over to you, Erin. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Angela. So glad you guys are all joining us this morning. Before we get started, I'm gonna share my screen in just about a little bit. I want to um, it sort of virtually introduce you guys to Emily, who is the young wildlife expert who is actually taking us through this virtual hike. Since filming this video, Emily has accepted a job at the Patuxent Wildlife Refuge in, in Washington, DC. So she was a fisheries and wildlife biologies major at NC State University. So she's who will be taking you through the virtual aspect and myself and, and Keith will be answering any questions you have as we go along. So I'm gonna go ahead and start. Oop. Uh, Angela, I don't have a screen sharing set up. All right, you should Just be good give, now. Sorry about that. That's all right. Just give us one minute. All right. Here we go. Oops. So we've already done our introduction and our welcome. All right, so we've talked about it um, a lot in the Kahoot about what the longleaf pine forests are, um, and of course they're located in what is called the North Carolina Sandhills. 
So what are the sand hills? Um, it's a three million acre preserve that spans North and South Carolina where longleaf pine forests still exist. And as our Cahoot said, only about 3% of the original pine, longleaf pine forests remain. So Millstone is really, really lucky and we're very happy to be situated sort of right there in the middle of that preserve. Um, they're characterized by deep rolling hills and or rolling hills and deep coarse sand, and they're wedged between the coastal plain and Piedmont regions of North and South Carolina and Georgia. Whoops, so what we're gonna do at this point is we're gonna go ahead and start our virtual hike, and we're gonna start with Emily, who's going to let us know, you know, if what we hope is after this program, you take some time to go outside and explore and see if you can find some of these species that we're about to talk about. And Emily is gonna give us a little briefing on what you need to have before you go. All right, guys, so this is going to be a video that I'm gonna share. And as we've done at the, the previous uh, Nature Adventures, I'm gonna share the URL in the chat window. So if you have any trouble with this, you can watch the videos yourself. Uh, and you can also go back and um, watch them later. So I'm gonna put this first video URL in the chat window and optimize for video clip. Here we go. And Emily's gonna tell us what we need to do when we go on a hike ourselves. So before we head on our hike today, there's a few things we need to make sure we have so that we can be prepared. First, you wanna make sure that you have lots of water with you. It's really hot here today, and I'm sure it's gonna be hot all summer. So before you sit out, make sure you have a full water bottle. You wanna make sure you have on good footwear, nothing with open toes. You wanna to make sure you're not gonna hurt yourself. Um, and then also you wanna make sure you tell a trusted adult where you're gonna be. This person needs to know what time you're gonna leave, when you plan on being back, and what route you're gonna take on your hike. And it's also really important that you're not going out on this hike alone. You need to make sure that you have at least three people with you. This is so that if one person gets hurt, there are two people to stay behind and one person to go get help. So no one is ever left alone while they're hurt. All right, great advice from Emily there on how to prepare for a hike yourself. And those are good tips for any hike that you would be going on. That's right. And just as a recap, water, plenty of water um, and snacks, closed toed shoes, let a, an adult know when, where, and what time you'll be back. And of course, have at least three people with you, preferably an adult. <laughs> Next. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and start talking about the different plant species you can find. Um, in, in the sand hills and the pine forests. And as we talked about in the Kahoot, there are a great many of them. So what we're gonna start with is the longleaf pine. All right, guys, and these will be videos as well. Give me just a second here to share the URLs with you. And we're gonna play three of these plant videos at a time and then we'll pause um, for questions. So as you're watching these, uh, if you have questions about the plants that, um, that you're learning about, just pop those in the chat. We're gonna play three of the plant videos at a time and then we'll pause for questions. So here, Emily's gonna tell us about a longleaf pine, which we've already learned quite a bit about but we'll see one at Millstone. And you'll also see that we have our American Sign Language interpreter um, joining us for these videos as well. Um, so that's Reed Barnes. You'll see him up in the, the corner of the video doing American Sign Language interpretation of what Emily is sharing with us. Here we have the most iconic tree species here in the Sand Hills, the longleaf pine. The longleaf pine adopted to the fire ecosystems here in the Sand Hills. And so when their cones feel the heat of the fire, they release their seeds. And this is also a really important tree species for the endangered woodpecker species, the red cockaded woodpecker found here in the Sand Hills. The longleaf pine are the only tree species they use to make their nesting cavities. All right, and then next we're gonna learn about the muscadine grape. So this is another very common plant species uh, that we found on our hike with Emily and she's gonna tell you about it. Here we have a species that's really common all throughout North Carolina. This is muscadine grape. 
And if you've ever had a muscadine grape, you know how excited we are to have these here. The way you can tell a muscadine grape is they have these really nice heart-shaped leaves with toothed edges. And then when you look at the end of the vines, you'll see that it's not forked. There's another species of grape that looks really similar called winter grape, but when you look at the end of its vine, it always splits off into a fork. Here in the Sandhills, muscadine are a really important food source for a lot of our small carnivores. So fox really depend on muscadine to help get them through the winter when animals aren't as abundant. And then our birds and raccoons also love muscadine grapes. All right, and then one more plant species and we'll pause for questions. So if you have any questions about this stuff, go ahead and put those in the chat. This is um, the sourwood tree, which is another common tree species uh, that grows in North Carolina and specifically in the longleaf um, pine ecosystem. Here we have the sourwood tree. And the sourwood tree is a really important tree species here in the Sand Hills because it's a really important early food source for honeybees. It flowers really early in the year. As you can see, we're in early summer and there's no flowers left on this. It's already bloomed and fallen off, but the bees really depend on it when they first come out of their hives for the winter as a honey source. And when you take a sourwood leaf and you smell it, it smells like green apple. So it's a really distinct way to be able to identify it because it has really generic leaves with no truly identifying characteristics, but smell is your best way to go to identify the sourwood tree. All right, and we'll pause here uh, for some questions. Let's see in the chat what we've got going on here. All right, it doesn't look like we've had any questions come up so far. Um, so let's ask our audience a question. Let's ask you, uh, ask you guys a question. Have you ever been to the sand hills? Have you ever seen a longleaf pine? Or do you think that you've seen a longleaf pine before? So we've got yes from Beth, yes from Chloe, uh, yes from Leah. Meredith hasn't been to the sand hills. Charles has. Lots of folks have been to the sand hills. Um, think so from Cynthia, yes from Olivia, yes Pam. Excellent. Oh, and Charles lives in the Sand Hills. Well, welcome. Uh, we'd love to have you come out to Millstone sometime right there in your backyard. Um, we haven't, but Caleb says they have a longleaf pine in their yard. That is really cool. Um, okay. Uh, so we'll, yes. I'm oh, sorry. We have a good question from Michelle. She said, how do you edit all of your videos? Oh, that is a good question. Um, so we actually, uh, when the pandemic started and we knew that we weren't going to be able to run camp anymore, uh, we decided to go out and film some of this, uh, film some of this video at our camp. So we went on a hike with Emily uh, and had her show us what we found along the way so that we could um, put this program together for you guys. And to actually edit that video together, um, we use iMovie. Um, is one of the softwares that that we use to put these um, put these together, and we have a, a video editor who works with us to to do that. <clears throat> you can it's a whole area of uh, of career that you can get into is interpretive video about nature if that's something that that you're interested in. Um, Ariana says she's never been to the sand hills, but she's seen a longleaf pine. Very cool. Rhett and Ella live in the Sand Hills as well. Welcome everybody who are living in the Sand Hills here. All right, so we're gonna finish up our um, videos from Emily on the plants, and then we'll switch gears uh, to go to um, animal tracks. Uh, so Emily's gonna tell us about sassafras now, which is another really unique plant. Uh, this is one of my favorite trees. Um, that you can find out in the sand hills. So let's see what Emily has to say about it. Here we have one of my favorite species in the sand hills. This is called sassafras. And this is a really important plant because a species of butterfly called the spicebush swallowtail depends on sassafras and members of its family to breed. They only lay their eggs on members of the sassafras family. And if you take off a leaf and smell it, a lot of people think it smells like root beer. It smells really nice but it's important that you don't eat it. It is not an edible plant. And the way you can identify sassafras is this three lobed leaf. A lot of people like to say that it looks like an otter's foot. That's a good way to help you remember it. And then the stems on sassafras are red. So you're looking for a three lobed leaf with red stems. 
and there we can see a picture of the sassafras uh, leaf. It's really unique. There's not any other tree that has that um, leaf shape. It makes the sassafras really unique and very cool. Uh, and now Emily's going to tell us about Chinese privet, uh, which is a species that um, should not be in the longleaf um, pine ecosystem. I see we sa somebody says they can't see the video, so I'm going to stop the share and try it again to see if it'll reload for you. Uh, and if not, I'll put all the URLs for these videos um, in the chat window uh, in just a few minutes so you can watch it that way. Here we have an invasive species found all across North Carolina. This is called Chinese privet, and as the name suggests, it's imported from China. It was brought over because a lot of people like the way it looks and it forms really nice shrubs, but it can really quickly colonize an area and take over. You can see this one goes all the way down our trail here. And they're also really hard to get rid of once they become introduced. So it's really important when you're thinking about planting things around your garden or your house that you check and make sure that they're native to our state. All right, and there you can see a close up of Chinese privet. Um, I did see a question in the chat that it, the tree that smells like green apples is edible and it is not. You want to be really, really careful about uh, eating plants of any kind. Um, generally not a good idea unless you are very sure that you know what that plant is and you know that it's edible. So here's another plant that is um, not as great to run into in the woods and that is poison ivy. So Emily's going to tell us how to identify poison ivy. Here we have a really important plant that you should learn if you're going to spend any time out in the woods. This is poison ivy. And you can tell it's poison ivy because it comes in leaves of three, has red stems, and then grows on this really tall vine. And so a good th few things to help you remember that are leaves of three, let it be, and if it's a hairy vine, it's no friend of mine. Even the vines can make you itchy. But poison ivy is not all bad. It is a really important food source in the late winter and in the fall because it makes really nice berries that birds and deer don't have any reaction to. All right, and tell us in the chat window if you have ever had poison ivy. I've had really bad cases of it and it is no fun. Uh, let us know if you've had poison ivy before too. Uh, and now you know how to identify it so you can stay away from it when you're out in the woods. Uh, and this will be our last video on plants and then we'll move on to animals. And this is gonna be on the dogwood tree. Here we have our state flower of North Carolina that actually grows on this tree. It's called the flowering dogwood. And these are really common throughout our forest in North Carolina. You can notice that on the leaves, they have really wide veins and kind of a heart shaped look. And that's a good way to help you identify it. And they also have those beautiful white flowers that bloom in early spring. All right, Erin, I'll hand it back to you so we can move on to animal. Absolutely, and so just I'll, I'll uh, flip through these really quickly so you guys can get a close up of these plants we were talking about. Um, and if you think of any questions, um, just let us know as, before we move on. This is sassafras, this is the Chinese privet, and this is a nice picture because you can actually see what the, what the blooms look like. And then poison ivy and the flowering dogwood. All right, and so now we're gonna go ahead and move on to animals. And we're gonna start this section out um, with, with another video. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about some of the, the common animal species that we find here in the Longleaf Pine Forest. Uh, this first video, we, we actually set up a, a bait station um, and, and, a, and a little track pad so we could sort of see what what um what animals are trafficking the area when we're not around all right and i'll share that video in just a second um looking at the chat window it looks like lots of folks have had poison ivy before we've got a few people uh who are highly allergic 
Um, some folks that touched it but didn't have a big reaction. Uh, and that's actually really interesting about poison ivy. If you are not highly allergic to it when you are young and the more you're exposed to it, the older you get, you become more allergic. If you are highly allergic to it when you're young, the more that you're exposed to it, the less allergic you become to it. Um, so that's kind of a really interesting fun fact about poison ivy. Um, so I'm gonna share our video, one of our last videos here um, from Emily where we set up a scent station. So she's gonna tell you how to set up a scent station so you can see uh, what kind of animals are in your area if this is something you wanna do. And she's gonna tell us what we found as well. So here we have what's called a scent station. So last night I came out here with a 50 pound bag of sand, a bottle of baby oil and three cans of sardines. And you clear the area on the ground and get all the sticks and debris out of the way. And then you put down your sand and mix that in with baby oil. And once you've got the top surface nice and level and smooth, you take a can of sardines and place it in the middle. And what this does is it attracts all the animals that are nearby and they come to check out the food in the middle. And when they do, because that baby oil is in the sand, it leaves really good footprint impression. So it's a great way to see what animals are hanging around your yard. So here in this scent station, it looks like we had a lot of raccoon visitors. You can see the really long handprints here. So raccoons have a really long foot pad and then short toes. And so the rain kind of distorted our footprints here, but this is a really good raccoon track. And then here again, we have more raccoons. And it looks like all of our sardines that we put out are gone. All right, and Erin, I'll give it back over to you to talk about other animals. And as we're doing that, guys, I will put all the URLs for the videos that we just watched in the chat window. Right, so the first uh, animal that she talked about was, of course, the raccoon. And a couple of fun things about raccoons. Raccoons have a very high IQ. They have a higher IQ than cats, and it really falls just below monkeys. They are mostly nocturnal. Um, they're omnivores, so they'll eat pretty much anything they can find. And raccoons can run up to 15 miles per hour, including when they're running up trees. They can still maintain that pace. Um, they don't have a lot of natural predators, which is surprising. So the thing that actually um, they have to watch out for most, that, that harms the most, it, our, our vehicles, and then diseases. The next animal there is the Eastern box turtle. Um, the Eastern box turtle is one of, I believe, seven species of box turtle, and it's the most common one here in the Sand Hills. They can live 40 to 50 years, and they don't actually real, reach their full size until they're 20 years old. So they continue to grow um, longer than most humans. Males, so one of the things is a lot of times you've probably seen uh, a turtle crossing the road. You've probably also heard that when you help a turtle cross the road, you need to keep it going in the same direction it was going. And that's because male turtles pretty much their whole life move one direction due to a homing instinct they have to find new territory. So if you ever decide to, um, to help a turtle cross the road, first of all, make sure that you're doing it very, very slave, overly cautious even, and make sure that you put it on the side of the road it was already going to. Don't turn it around and send him the other way because then he's just gonna turn around and do it again. <laughs> um, turtles also will eat pretty much anything they can find. Bugs, frogs, berries. I mean, if it's, it's small enough for them, they'll eat it. Um, this last animal here, this is a gray fox. Um, gray foxes are carnivores, but like Emily talked about in the muscadine grape video, although they're mainly carnivores, they will eat grapes um, and some other fruit when they're desperate. Again, they're nocturnal. They'll start becoming active around dusk and they weigh only, they'll only get to up to about seven to 15 pounds, which is about the size of most house cats. So although they look larger, they're very light, very quick animals. Okay, any questions about those? Yeah, we got a couple questions, Erin. Um, really good question from Mary Catherine here. Um, oh, sorry, she's saying we have lots of turtles in our woods. We see them all the time as well. And then the question was from uh, Leah. Do turtle shells grow or do they lose it and grow a new one? Turtle shells grow. So turtles, um, their shell is actually, the best way to think of it is 
part of their bone structure. So they're not like snails and some other animals that sort of outgrow their home and then find a new one. That shell will grow with them. Um, which is why it's important also, I know a lot of people think it's really fun when you find a turtle to paint something uh, pretty and colorful and identifying on it, but they, again, they'll keep that shell their whole life, and by painting it unnatural colors or bright colors, you're making them more obvious to predators. You're taking away their camouflage. So that turtle's shell is its home for its whole life, which is why it's so important that it stays protected and as camouflaged as possible. Excellent. And then we got a couple of questions. Um, Ariana asked, what do they eat? And Alicia, similar, is a turtle an omnivore? Great question, Alicia. That's a good term. Yeah, they are omnivores because they'll eat bugs, um, small frogs. Again, they'll pretty much eat anything that is, they eat, like, they love fruit, vegetation, like grasses, anything that's down low enough <laughs> that they can catch and that's small enough for them to consume, they pretty much will. All right, and then Bayless asked, why do turtles move so slow? Well, partly because of how they're formed. So you can see that their legs pretty much go out to the side. You know, they don't stand really upright the way we do. And then they're carrying a decent amount of weight. Um, they really, it's not as necessary for them to move quickly because their main means of protection is by, you know, pulling back into that shell. So while a lot of animals have speed as a way of evading predators, a turtle doesn't really need that because if they're being threatened, they're just gonna they're just gonna close the doors and and uh, and hide. All right. Uh, and then Lillian asked if you can find them in the mountains. You know, I don't want to steer you wrong, so. I would think so, but I'm not actually 100% sure. I'm sure there is some species of box turtle you can find in the mountains. This little guy in particular, I, I'm not sure. So if anybody in the chat knows, feel free to teach us both. <laughs> um, all right, and we've got a few folks saying, yes, they're definitely in the mountains. I think you can find box turtles all over North Carolina. Um, yep. And then from Jessica, this is a really interesting um, comment that I'm going to share. Um, and she says, the pattern on the eastern box turtle shell is seen as dancing ladies in a circle to many indigenous tribes in the southeast. I did not know that. And that is really cool. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. That is very neat. Um, and then one question, one last question before, because we're getting in um, almost at time here. How does poison ivy spread? Um, on skin or as it's growing? Um, just, they just asked how does ivy, how does ivy spread? So I guess either or both. Okay, well we'll talk about both. Um, it spreads on your skin through an oil called urushiol and you, so that's, that's what, that's what makes, you know, poison oak, poison sumac, and poison ivy poisonous is this oil they carry and what happens is when you brush up against it, if any part of it breaks or any you know, amount of that oil gets on your skin for, you know, hours afterwards, if you touch it and then touch another part of yourself. So if like you itch your arm and then itch your leg, you're risking spreading those oils and, you know, they cause the skin to create those light itchy blisters, you know, and that's, that's really how it spreads. So the best thing you can do is anytime you've been out in the woods, first of all, it's best to wear high socks, tall boots and pants. And then when you get home, wash your hands and wash your clothes just in case, because it's very possible that you've brushed up against poison ivy and miss it. Um, the other, the best thing you can do is just know very well what it looks like and avoid it. As far as how it grows, of course it can grow mostly on vines up trees, but it also can grow on vines running across the ground as well, but it is a vine plant. I hope oh, that answers that right. before. Thank you, Aaron. And then we've got a, a tip from Jamie in the chat. It says an Epsom salt bath, if you have a bad case, will dry it out. Um, and then I, I've also seen a couple of questions from folks asking for uh, an ocean or a shark Zoom uh, sometime. And we are absolutely going to do that. We've Our last one um, in the beginning of December is going to be on shark's teeth and fossils. And we'll talk a lot about sharks during that one. Uh, and then we had one on coastal ecology, which are, was our first one, and you can check out the recording of that as well. Um, so finally, we've got one last video. Um, when we went on the hike with Emily around Millstone, we didn't really run into a ton of animals, but she did find um, some additional um, 
tracks for us to look at. So that's going to be our last video here. And then we will wrap up with any final questions. Here we have a white-tailed deer track. These are really common visitors here at Millstone. They love all of our berries and nice forbs we have for them to eat. You can tell it's a white-tailed deer track because, like cows, they're undulate, which means they have a hoof with two parts that splits in the front. So you look for the forked split hoof, and they're usually about two to three inches, though if they're a really large deer, they can be more like five inches long. All right, and I will pop the URL for that in the window here as well. Okay, and let's see, we'll um, look for our last questions here. We're almost at time. I'm gonna say thank you to Erin and to our team at Millstone and for um, Emily. So exciting that she's now doing what she did for us here full time. Um, Candace says we have a lot of white-tailed deer where I live. Yes, they're very common all over uh, North Carolina. Um, Let's see what else. Do box turtles live in Asheville? Maybe not in the city of Asheville, but uh, certainly in the area um, area around uh, the city there. All right, so um, that's going to conclude our program. Uh, thank you all so much. We had a lot of fun learning with you today. Please do check out our Nature Adventures program schedule for the remainder of the fall semester. So like I said, we've got sharks, teeth, and fossils coming up in December. Um, we had coastal ecology and you um, can, can check out the recording of that. All of these programs can be attended either live or you can register for the recorded versions if your schedule doesn't allow you to join us live. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about North Carolina 4-H, uh, get in touch with your local county 4-H program. So you can go to the URL in the chat window and look up who your 4-H agent is. Um, and there are programs uh, happening in your county that you can get involved in. Um, everyone that's attending today is going to receive a link to the recording, uh, and we hope you're going to join us for the next Nature Adventures program, which is on October 27th at 1 p.m. Uh, so we're changing the time. That one will be in the early afternoon instead of the morning, um, and we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're actually going to do an astronomy lesson um, on October 27th at 1 p.m. So you'll get to learn about some iconic constellations that you can look up and see in the night sky. We'll learn a bit about the myths or stories um, that people tell um, in, in relation to the constellations in the sky, and we'll learn about some, some current events that are going on at that time. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll be a little different than what we've been doing here. Um, help us get the word out if you thought this was fun and you want to share it with a friend or share it with a teacher. Uh, the more uh, folks that we have uh, at these, the better. Um, so registration is still open for those remaining programs going to put that link in the chat window as well. Um, and we hope to see you on October 27th. So thanks again to our Millstone team. Thanks to Dave. Thanks to Emily. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, we had fun. We hope you had fun as well. Bye, everyone.